Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't like standing on that red dot. It doesn't go with my shoes. And I've got ADD, so <laughs> I'll try. I'm not gonna get distracted. And uh, you know, it's odd, I always like to think of myself, PhD, ADD, Dave Gallo, ADD, PhD. People say, well, what does that mean? Uh, well, <laughs> I was born with ADD. I didn't know that till recently when my sons were being tested for ADD. And then, then, I started, then high school and grades to school started to make sense to me when I said, what are all these people writing about? You know, what's all this note taking? And I look back, I was a horrible student. I was a horrible student. And I look back at my report cards and you'll know, see C plus, uh, D, uh, occasional B. But the worst part was the side about my personality, where I had all these check marks, does not work to ability, talks out of turn, disturbs others. I moved off the dot, then I, okay. <laughs> disturbs others. And uh, I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to study the stars. I, you know, I was captain of the science team, uh, president of the math and science club, but my teachers and guidance counselors and tests said, you know, you better do something else with your life. And I did. I sold shoes for like, sold shoes for like for, for well, seven years after, after high school. <laughs> so um, one day, 1976, there I am in the shoe department looking through National Geographic magazine. And there was an article by Bob Ballard about exploring the oceans. And it stopped me in my tracks because I'm flipping through that thing and I'm in my mid-twenties, and it shows this underwater mountain range. It's at the bottom of the ocean. We don't know what's down there, uh, but there's an underwater mountain range, and it showed this little speck on that mountain range, and it blew it out, and it was hand-drawn, and it said that little speck is a submarine Elvin, and uh, inside that little speck, that submarine, were three people, Bob Ballard, and they were exploring this unbelievable world, mountains higher than the Alps and stuff like that. And, and you know what it did? It didn't make me smarter, but it ignited my curiosity. And I took that magazine, and right across the parking lot was the State University of New York at Albany. And over there I went with that and found out that any question was a good question. There were no stupid questions, and we didn't know answers to a lot of the questions. And it was okay to, ask, to actually be wrong about something. And it was two years, it took me two years to go from selling shoes to making my first dive in that submarine. And, and honest to goodness, all it was had to do with focus and curiosity. So what I'm hoping today I can do here with you, share some of the stuff we've seen, and maybe there's one of these images, grab you and do the same thing to you. And you know, I don't know what you think about when you think about the ocean. Do you think about the beach? You know, do you think about uh, the waves, the surfing and stuff like that. You know, I grew up not far from Lake Ontario in the middle of New York State, so much like you, I had a, a great lake right in my backyard. I didn't know much about the ocean. Whales, you think about whales, we study whales you know, in oceanography. We study beaches, we study the waves, we study sharks. You know, we, we got the wrong idea about sharks, but uh, and, and that's shark smiling, a very happy, happy <laughs> very happy shark. Uh, but when we think of the world, uh, the ocean, this is what we study. We study the whole planet, and because uh, it's an ocean planet, 70% covered with ocean. And here's the message about that: oceanography's got these two parts of it. One is that most of the planet's unexplored. We've only explored about five, six percent of what's under the sea. Still today, five or six percent of 70% of the Earth. That's amazing. So pretty much that planet's unexplored. So there's, and there's a lot of excitement about the exploration, but the other side of it is, this is your home, it's your house. Protect this house because it's not in great shape. You know, we, we need to understand all the details of what's going on, but the headlines aren't good. All the indications are heading in the wrong way. And, and maybe we said, well, we didn't really know, but now we do know, so we gotta make steps to get back on track. This is the way oceanographers really see the Earth. So that's the Pacific Ocean, you strip the clouds away, and look at the ocean, and I said before, 70% covered with water, with ocean, average depth about two miles. You'd be hard pressed to look, find any continent if you rotate the Earth around to that Pacific Ocean and look at it like that. So it just gives you an idea about how much water there really is on the planet. And when you make a map of it and look at the seafloor, it's an amazing place, even in that 5% that we studied. It's got the greatest mountain range on Earth, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, Mid-Oceanic Ridge, it wraps around the Earth like the seams of a baseball. You can see it, the mountain range right down the middle of the Atlantic between North America, South America, Africa, and Europe. It's in the Pacific Ocean too. Thousands of mountains higher than the Alps, thousands of peaks, huge peaks. Thousands of valleys wider and deeper than the Grand Canyon. And on top of that, 
underwater rivers, underwater lakes, underwater waterfalls. Almost everything we find on land, we find at the bottom of the sea, only it's always more dramatic. So it's an incredible, it's not this big blue fishbowl that we think about. Um, to get there, you know, science is all about observation, and when you're working two miles deep, the average depth, you've got to have tools, and a lot of the community in oceanography, in oceanography, if you like making gadgets, if you like engineering, we have to build our own robots, our own cameras, our own sonars. You can't go to Hertz or Avis or whatever and rent a robot to go to the very bottom of the sea. Someday you might be able to, but a lot of that stuff we have to make ourselves, and we're just getting into the age of robots. But we're still in the age of submarines, too. The same thing that got me first hooked on this field. This is an Elvin launch, and it's pretty cool. It's a, Elvin's a submarine. It's at Woods Hole right now, and it holds three people. You're in a small space. It's about seven feet across, a small little bubble. You close the hatch. You've got everything you need inside there, and there's three people in there right now getting ready to go off the back of the ship, all of them asking the very important question, should I go to the bathroom one more time? It's, a, it's like 10 hour day inside that sub. And once you splash down, you know, it's, it's, it's a really exciting moment because right here, you start to enter a whole different world. You, you don't hear the surface ship anymore, all the machinery. You start to hear the pinging of the sonar to the bottom of the ocean and back up. A diver checks out the outside of the sub and then he says, okay, clear to dive, all the equipment's okay and down you go. Two and a half hour trip down to the average depth of the ocean. You go light blue, deep blue, dark blue, pitch black for about two hours of it. And we were so sure that it, because it's pitch black, never been sunlight, no plants, should be no life. But instead, uh, when we stop and look, we find amazing amounts of life. And even in the bottom of the ocean, so Elvin goes to about the mid-depth of the ocean. Jim Cameron, the guy that did Terminator, the Hollywood director, um, Titanic, Avatar built his own sub to go to the deepest part of the ocean, seven miles. So when you look up at the sky and see a jet traveling across the sky with those vapor trails out the back, that's how deep, that's the deepest part of the Marianas Trench. And that's where Jim went inside his sub. So now we're fully prepared to take people to go as humans all the way down to the very deepest part of the ocean. And, and so, so positively sure there'd be no life. And instead what we find is immense amounts of life. Almost everywhere we look, we find incredible animals that live inside the deep. I love this one. It's, I'll call it a jellyfish. It's a siphonophore. It's a colonial animal. It's got all sorts of moving parts. My point that I want you to know is that it'd be really tough to catch this in a net, bring it up on the ship and try it when it gets mushed and you end up with a net full of body parts, mush and body parts, and try to put the animal back together again. These animals are too beautiful. They really have to get in the water and see them where they live so we can begin to understand what it is they do. You know, they're great. They've got these lovely, graceful movements. Um, they've got bioluminescence, so they light up, they twinkle in, in the dark. Same thing as fireflies. Fascinating world. Keep on going down to the bottom. This is a hand-drawn picture by Ken Marshall, but finally we've got the technology that we can go to a place like Titanic and make a virtual Titanic. And we did that back a year or so ago. We took a team out I was co-expedition leader, and we mapped Titanic from top to bottom, every single object in the debris field, and we're putting together a virtual Titanic. The goal there is that someday, soon I hope, you'll be able to, on an Xbox, PlayStation, uh, uh, iPhone, whatever, uh, be able to explore Titanic the same way we do. You can explore this virtual world. There's a lot to be said about shipwrecks on the deep sea, a lot of lessons to be learned. Uh, and that mountain range itself, you know, when we go to the top of that mountain range, it's mostly volcanic, and that's hot water coming out. Average temperature about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Really poisonous stuff. We never thought there'd be any life there at all, too. In fact, we said there should be nothing there because of the temperature and the poisons. And instead, we find communities of life that rival the tropical rainforest. We were absolutely wrong about life on this planet. You know, and it took exploration to do that. When you explore, you know, you're looking for a Titanic. You've got some idea what you're looking for, and it would be amazing not to find it, because we know it sank, and we knew what it was. We're just looking for where it ended up. But when you're really exploring the ocean, you know, we've done 5%, you don't know what's going to be next. And this is one of those great instances, because if you're in the sub where you're sitting now, you look out the window, and you see a puddle of water on the bottom of the ocean sitting there. And sometimes those puddles are big. They can be a mile across, 10 miles long, 300 feet deep, lakes beneath the sea, super salty lakes. 
And what I love about it is when these were first found, the biologists the board said, well, nothing can live in there. It's too salty, too this, too that. And we said, that's true, except for all these animals. We see <laughs> it's just full of animals, but, th but they don't know that. So, and there's animals that live along the edge of these lakes. It's just, these are amazing places at the bottom of the sea. So when you're really exploring, you've got to know, uh, you've got to be prepared for anything that comes out of the darkness of the deep sea. Even in the shallow water, I've got to show you this clip. Uh, this is work done by Roger Hanlon at the Marine Biological Laboratory. There's a barracuda. Even in shallow water, if you observe, if you sit still, if you're patient, you'll see some amazing things. Roger studies camouflage and octopuses and other things called cephalopods. And uh, here comes Roger creeping up on this algae. Watch this. Boom. Yeah, how about that? So that's a pretty big octopus, right? And, uh, and then when, when it realizes that Roger sees it, off it goes. Roger kicks as hard as he can, catches up to it, and then the octopus tries to bluff his way out of it, but making his eye spot really big. But do it backwards and watch this. And here's the amazing thing to me, that that animal on the right side right there, a smooth skin, light skin animal, can turn into that stuff on the left. How is that possible? I mean, it's got to change its texture, it's got to change its color. But watch this, this is slowed down, so really it happens like that. Look at that. Yep, you wouldn't think it could happen. That's amazing stuff, amazing stuff. So what's even more amazing to me is that when you look at this Earth, okay, so the daytime Earth, if you're in space, if you're in the space station looking at the planet, you'd have a really hard time seeing humanity during the daylight on Earth. But we're there, seven billion people are on that planet. And you know, just like a virus that you don't, you don't see on this, on this organism, we're making the planet sick. It's, and it's not always oil spills and things like that. Sometimes it's just the stuff that trickles out of our everyday life. It's plastics. It's things like uh, uh, fertilizers. It's flame retardants. It's stuff that just makes its way eventually. What you put on the, on the city streets here in Chicago it will eventually make its way to the ocean. And no matter where you live on the earth, whatever you put on the ground eventually makes its way to the sea. And little by little, we've made the ocean sick. And the oceans are absorbing a lot of this human-created carbon dioxide, too, that we hear about with global warming. The oceans are being acidic. They're turning into acid, carbonic acid. Not a good thing. And we're trying to figure out how bad it really is. Uh, but it sounds really bad. So we've got, and again, we can make the statement we never knew, but now we do. And, and I, I don't think it's cause for panic, but it is time to start adjusting to changing our habits just a little bit. This is the Earth at Night by a company up in Canada called WorldSat. So it's the same image as before, but it's nighttime. And check that out. There we are. You know, in the other image, you don't see us. Here, here we do. Just like those jellyfish, the Earth lights up at night. And there's really four kinds of lights up, up there. And I'm going to show you really two of them. Uh, that, that's, those are the lights of the modern world. Oops. Modern world right there. We'll call it the modern world. It's electricity, electric lights. And that's North America, clear as a bell, right? This is Africa. If you look at sub-Saharan Africa, in the, in the Sahara, you don't see anything at all. But look at all those gold dots. Those are village fires. That's their, it's for heat, it's for food. It's, it's, for, it's for all the things that we normally do with electricity here. And the thing that gets to me is that in that part of the world, from here on up through the Middle East and into Asia, there's about a billion and a half people clinging to life, clinging to life. Every single day is a struggle. Why? because they don't have adequate sanitary water. They don't have water. On a planet that we started saying was the ocean planet, 70% covered with water, average depth two miles. How can this be that like 20, 30% of the population's on the verge of ex extinction because they don't have water? So we decided to look at how much water is really on the earth, and this surprised us too. We didn't have to go out to sea to surprise us. We just sat in the laboratory and said, let's take all the water off the planet, see how much there is. So that's the Earth on the, on the left, of course. All the water is in that ball on the right. That's a volume of water. So if the Earth is the size of a basketball and you're holding it in your hand, imagine that. Take all the water off the Earth. It'll fit into a ping pong ball easily. Imagine putting a ping pong ball full of water on a basketball. It's hard to do. You can't imagine it. I mean, it's thinner than the frost on a glass, and it is. Because I said the average depth is two miles, but across the Atlantic Ocean is 3,000 miles. So the layer of water is 3,000 by two. In the Pacific, it's 10,000 by two. The water is, you know, it's thinner than the frost on a glass. It's thinner than the skin on an apple, thinner than paint, any way you want to put it. There's hardly any water on Earth at all. 
That little point to the right of the ball is all the fresh water. That's all there is on the whole planet. That's the lakes, the glaciers, the groundwater. And for us to live the way we do and animals to live the way we, they like to live and plants and stuff, you've got to take that little bit of fresh water, put it in just the right places at just the right amounts, just the right time of year. And that's, that's one of the things we worry about most because the oceans really do control where that water ends up. Think of this, the message from the oceans, when our relationship with the sea. It's the air we breathe. Every other fresh uh, breath of fresh air you take, you can thank the ocean for that oxygen that comes out of the sea, 50%. The food we eat, whether it's seafood or food that grows up along the edge of the sea, the water we drink, just what I showed you with rainfall, the air we breathe, food we eat, water we drink, all about that part of the ocean. Uh, all because you can thank the ocean for that, uh, this world that we've hardly explored. In the future, you know, there's a quote by Marcel Proust, the true voyage of exploration is not so much in seeking new landscapes as in having new eyes. And with all this new technology, we've got the new eyes. We're going to have new information, and the hope is we start looking at this planet and thinking about it differently. Thank you very much. Thank you.